Michael Adams, and I am co-founder and uh, president of Common Bonds. It is our desire here at Common Bonds to educate uh, around what drives racism against African Americans. We desire to have uh, necessary conversations about it. And also, what's more important, we want to see what we can do together to help dismantle racism. I love to quote uh, James Baldwin. Uh, he's one of my favorite uh, activists and writers. And he said, and nobody knows my name, he said that a country is only as strong as the people who make it up. And the country is going to turn into whatever the people want it to become. He goes on to say that this country will be transformed. And it won't be transformed by an act of God. It's going to be transformed by us, by all of us, by you and me. And I think that this transformation begins with conversation, with dialogue, with having these uh, tough but important conversations about racism. I'd like to think that we can't change anything if we don't face it. So I want to thank you guys so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for your courage. Thank you for being open. Thank you for your willingness to, to uh, hear the uh, stories of racism. Thanks for your willingness to share. Um, this can happen without all of you. So I Thank you on behalf of Mike. We thank you for joining us tonight. Tonight, we have a really special person who's going to help uh, facilitate this conversation about racism. Um, we have Karen Spencer Kelly. Miss Kelly is a Harvard grad. She's a Villanova law grad, and she's a practicing attorney who has her own consulting uh, firm that's focused on helping organizations handle diversity, equity, and inclusion challenges. Ms. Kelly specializes in unconscious bias and microaggressions. Ms. Kelly states that diversity and inclusion are essential to shaping uh, the workforce financially, socially, creatively, creatively, and even spiritually. Um, Ms. Kelly believes that beyond the mere optics of a diverse group of employees, a healthy, diverse, and inclusive, inclusive culture has the power to change a company from being good to great. And I believe that the same thing is true for, uh, let's say, a family, a neighborhood, and even a country. Diversity has the power to create greatness and so we are really blessed to have miss uh, kelly to uh help uh lead this conversation about uh diversity in the workplace um and so uh what i'm going to do is i want to introduce our facilitator tonight who's going to have this dialogue with miss kelly and and that is none other than marissa d candido um she is a super talented member of Common Bonds. She's a member of our creative team. Um, she works in, in, in advertising and digital media. The, the beautiful website is all her and Nina uh, Carter, of course. Um, and so without further ado, I want to introduce the beautiful Miss Marissa DeCandido, and she's going to facilitate the conversation with Karen Spencer Kelly. Thank you so much, April. I really appreciate those kind words. Um, and before we get started, I do just want to uh, emphasize what April said about please muting your microphone and also be aware that um, with Google Meet, others can see your uh, video if you are on camera. So you can leave your video on, um, but you can also change the view of your screen so that you can just see Karen throughout this presentation and not uh, look at everybody else's screen. So if you just go down to the bottom, there's three little dots on the right hand side and you can just press change layout. Um, so without further ado, let us dive into this conversation. Karen, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate the kind introduction. It was really very generous. And um, I am so happy to be here with you tonight. Um, you can hear me all right. Is everything okay? 
Yeah, um, yeah. So uh, several weeks ago, I met Mike and learned about Common Bonds. And I was so excited about what you're doing and what your intention is. Because it, to me, to me, the way, and, and like April was just saying, it's about conversation. And without the conversation, things can't happen. And conversation is necessarily um, challenging. And the way that Common Bonds has set itself up and organized itself, it is begging for these challenging conversations. And as soon as I heard about this and I was talking to Mike, I thought, you know what, this is something I want to be a part of, something that I want to support, because I think that this is the way, and I honestly think it's the only way that things are going to change, uh, especially in light of the way that the country is so polarized right now, unless there is some sort of form of conversation and um, it, things won't change. And it needs to be the kind of conversation between people who are willing to have the conversations. And we can talk in a little bit about um, how do we get people to have these conversations, uh, but it's gotta be at least among the first group of people who say, you know what, this is important. White people and black people who both agree, let's, let's start this dialogue and let's give each other instruction about how do we continue to share this with others around ourselves um, so that we can continue and expand the, the, the conversation so that the country can ultimately change. And I am one of these, um, maybe it's a little dreamy eyed, but I think that we can get ourselves back on a different track. Uh, it is definitely gonna take work. It's gonna take work by people who are honest and open and challenging each other but I really have faith that this can come about, but it needs, it needs guidance, it needs support, and people necessarily need um, instruction about how to do it, how to have these conversations and how to go forward. So um, I, I just wanted to start by saying, I'm so grateful to the fact that April and Mike created um, Common Bonds, it's just, um, so important and and i just have so much faith in what it can do going forward and i'm incredibly grateful to be a part of the conversation as 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 it goes as it goes forward so well, we are so grateful to to have you here tonight and to really have these tough conversations and have some of that guidance because um in in the discussions that we've had over the past few months we have gotten so many questions from people about how can I make this change in my environment? How can I start these conversations? And so I think our, our conversation here tonight will, will help everybody. Um, everyone will come away with some of those things that they can take forward and hopefully start some of those conversations. Great, well, that's always my goal when I have conversations or, or have presentations with different groups of people. It's it works when we can let people have things that they can take away with themselves to say, you know, if I learned one thing tonight, it is to do X, Y, and Z. Or if I learned two things tonight, that's terrific. But so let's make sure that we cover enough ground so that people can hear a few things that they can take away and they feel comfortable with, um, with sharing, uh, adopting and sharing, because that's the other piece of it. Um, it's so important that these conversations are authentic. So if, I mean, I can listen to somebody else and think, okay, that's a great idea, but if I can't own it, I can't share it. So it's really important for people to know that they, that they have this authentic sense of, here's something that I heard, it really meant something to me. I can repeat this, I can repeat it in a way that's not just rote repetition of someone else's words, but it's what I actually, can adopt and can share. So it's, I think that that's really important. And hopefully the plan will be that by the end of the evening, people can say, okay, I, I, I've got a few things I can take away or one thing. I mean, I'm happy for one thing for people to be able to take away. That's, um, that's, that's part of the goal. So um, if I can just start really quickly, just from my past and sort of- Absolutely, yeah, that's, that was my next question for you. <laughs> Great. 
So I grew up on the North shore of Chicago. And it's funny, we, we had a little prep session and I forgot to mention all of this in my prep session. Um, I, I grew up in a family, a, a black family, but my father was very dark skinned. My mother was so light skinned that they always presumed that she was white. And that had a huge impact on how we were treated in grocery stores, how we were treated on the street, how we were treated. I mean, how many times my mother had to say, well, if we'd be at a checkout in a grocery line and we literally would all be putting everything on the, on the, um, on the checkout line. And the checkout person would look at my mother and say, is all of this yours? And she'd say, Yes, these are my children, right? <laughs> because we didn't look like her. And that was always a major issue in terms of our growing up to like, who, who did we look like? Uh, and what impact did that have on how we all felt, how we all felt about, um, about each other and about the community. My father, my father was a doctor. My mother was a lawyer. My father was a um, uh, the the head doctor at the the black hospital uh in evanston illinois like outside of chicago and we were very closely connected with the black community there but there was always this issue of my light-skinned mother like what did that mean or how did that play into everything and it was challenging it was it was always an issue um whether it was for for good or for ill but it, it definitely um it really was a matter um, we went to, my sisters and I went to an all white prep school and we were the family that was there to integrate the school. Uh, I came in in kindergarten and had no idea that that was what I was meant to be doing. My parents, um, and it's interesting, I'm not quite sure what their motivation was um, other than, well, other than to be forces for integration. My father had been the head of the NAACP uh, in Evanston. Uh, my mother was an, uh, a ward leader in, in Evanston. Um, so they were politically active. And I think it was just a matter of, okay, here we've got this opportunity to integrate an institution and we're gonna have our kids get into this and do it. So um, starting in kindergarten, uh, all that I knew was these were my friends and that's really what mattered. And it's interesting because it wasn't until years later when I was out, out of, um, out of college that I found out why certain people had behaved towards me the way that they did, because I didn't know that there were all white, um, country clubs where a girlfriend would be having a party and I wasn't invited. You know, I had no idea that there were Jewish country clubs where I wasn't invited and that was uh, not open to me. All I knew was that on Monday morning when everyone was talking about going to a party and having a good time, I had not been included in that. Um, I also didn't know I was the class valedictorian and it wasn't until years later that someone told me, well, so-and-so's mother said that they didn't want you to be the val valedictorian because you were black. And I thought, well, I was the top of the class and I was the number one person and that only kind of makes sense. What was the, I, and it was just confusing. It was confusing to me. I didn't really understand it. Um, so there were a bunch of different stories that came to light when I got older and I sort of realized, you know what, I was in a very segregated environment that didn't become aware to me until, until much later. And much later meant when I got to college. And when I got to college, I found out that there were there was a variety of people who had negative things to say about groups of people or uh, different experiences or well everything 
and I was so naive. I mean, I, I really had no clue. I, the first time that I heard someone say, well, you know, they did that because they were Jewish. And I looked at the person and I thought, what does that even mean? Because they were Jewish. I mean, what is, what, what are you even talking about? Is Well, you know how Jews are. And I was like, no, I don't know how Jews are. <laughs> what do you mean? But very quickly, it became obvious to me that there were so many levels and types of, um, of racism and discrimination and uh, classism and like all these things that had just been completely uh, off of my radar from the time that I was in this small you know, North Shore prep school until all of a sudden I got to college and then I kind of realized that this is this is what people are doing and this is not um, this is not okay and what that then led me to do sort of going forward was talking to friends and colleagues about what what their life experiences were and what what mine were when I was kind of realizing what what had happened to me and what was going on um, just to get to the subject of um, microaggressions is I hadn't really thought about how many ways microaggressions had come into my life and I well one one instance I was I was married to uh, a white man and we were in a small apartment and um, well actually this might probably isn't a microaggression it's just, just an aggression uh, PGW came in to turn our uh, gas on and my ex-husband was talking to the gentleman and everything was fine. I come out of the bedroom and all of a sudden, oh, well, we can't fix this. This isn't going to work. We're not going to, we're not going to be able to do this. And my ex-husband was like, well, wait, like five minutes ago, everything was okay. What, what is the problem? You know, what, what, what is the matter? Like, oh, well, we can't, we can't fix this. I mean, this, this is not, not all right with us. Um, when we were kids, um, I remember being on a trip with uh, my whole family and um arriving at a, at a hotel where we had a reservation late one evening and my father went in to check on the reservation and my father came out just furious just furious and he he said they're not letting us stay here and i can't remember what what town it was in but it was so clear, he said, they're not letting us stay here because we're black. It's as easy as that. So we're going to go to, and we did something uh, like outrageous. We went to the Four Seasons or something like that. I mean, it was just crazy. But he was so mad. He was just like, this is, this is absolutely outrageous. You know, we're going to go where, where we're allowed in um, as opposed to uh, where we were so clearly being discriminated against. Um, I, I am thinking about one uh, one microaggression example. And speaking of microaggressions, what they are, it's basically um, events that occur that uh, on a regular basis that are potentially seen as minor events, but which nonetheless make the recipient of them, and it's normally a black person, feel bad. It's because um, you step into an elevator and the white woman in the back of the elevator grabs her purse closer to her chest. Um, it's, um, well, here's my, here's one of my favorite microaggressions, I think. Um, I had a, a colleague who was the um, secretary of the treasury and uh, President Barack Obama was president at that point. And the Secretary of the Treasury kept saying, Barrack, we're going to call him Barrack. And I said, no, his name is Barack. No, we're going to call him Barrack. And I thought, well, that's hostile. <laughs> you, know, don't, you know, don't do not do that. I mean, it was, it was really, I thought, um, inappropriate. But it's, it's that kind of calling someone by the wrong name, calling someone 
um, by something that's not appropriate. Um, letting someone feel like they are less than they, than they necessarily could or should be um, in terms of in terms of conversation, uh, visibility, um, presentation, like any of those things. So these microaggressions are really powerful. I mean, they can make you feel just terrible, but I think that the key thing is that how they make you feel. Um, they make you feel, they make you feel bad. I don't know how else to put it. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's, um, that's aggressive in and of itself. And that's the kind of thing that um, we need to talk about and let other people be aware of so that they can not, oh, so they can not necessarily do such things. Um, just really quickly, uh, I have really great girlfriends who say all the time, oh, your skin is so beautiful. And they haven't looked at my skin. They haven't seen me. And I feel like, you know what? I, I, I wonder, are you really looking at me? Or are you just saying that because I've got black skin? I'm not, I'm not quite sure um, if that can be necessarily problematic. Um, and just another, um, and I don't know whether this is a, a micro or a macro aggression, but um, when I was in law school, I had a pretty successful first year. And as a consequence of that, the um, head of the admissions association, admissions office, decided that I should not be considered as a, a black student. And it was, you know, what was that about? Well, your father is a doctor, your mother's a lawyer, you went to Harvard, you've got all these, da, da, da. So we're not gonna consider you to be a black student, we're going to take you out of that pool. And I had to go in and say, what, what are you talking about? Oh, well, clearly this, this is not what the, the typical black experience is. And so we're not gonna allow you to be considered a black student. And I thought, you know, that's crazy. I mean, that, that's absolutely, fortunately she's still not, she's not there anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but it was that kind of craziness where sometimes people just they're they're thinking along different lines and it's problematic from a whole different point uh, lots of different points of view um and and really troublesome um so i i think that what we need to do is listen to what people are saying um pay attention to how they're saying it. And then I think the most uh, challenging thing is what do we do about that? When we are confronted with a statement, a situation um, like Barack Obama, it was stop saying that. That is not his name. Call him by his name, <laughs> right? Um, no, I am, you know, I am, I am black. I'm a member of this organization. I'm a member of the, the Black Students Association. I am a Black student here in this, uh, in this law school. Keep me in that position. How do we say, how do we have the courage to speak up um, about, about, these, about these different situations? And I'll, I'll tell you, I, I spoke to a bunch of girlfriends about um, their different experiences and I, I got multiple responses and I'm happy to share them with you. But to a woman and to an instance, they said they weren't sure how to deal with what was being said to them. No matter how offended they were or no matter how offensive the comment was, or they, they said, well, you know what I did? I just kept the conversation going. I just kind of kept rolling. And, and left it alone and I thought I'd figure it out later because it goes back to the very beginning of our conversation here is how do we have these discussions? How do we give people language to speak to each other? How do we 
empower people to talk to each other and not be fearful about what's being said, how it's being said, how it's being um, received. And we've got to be able to start to have these brave conversations and allow others to, to hear it. And I was grateful when I was talking to these women about their microaggressions or their macroaggressions, it didn't matter which, to be able to say, I'm talking to a group tonight where they specifically talk about black people and white people having these conversations and how do we have them going forward? And they were like, tell me, let me know. <laughs> let me know because I've got to understand how we make this better. And this is how we make it better by common bonds, by having these kinds of evenings where situations are laid out and conversations are had and people share about what they've done, what they've done, what's been successful. And a lot of times it is not going to be successful. Um, uh, one of my gal pals was telling me that um, she had uh, a colleague who, um, who had a, a, a name that was difficult to pronounce, uh, an African-American woman. And they were having this presentation. And every time the woman's name was pronounced, it was mispronounced. Mispronounced, mispronounced, mispronounced. And finally she said, my name is X. And there was a giggle throughout the room. And the leader of the group said, oh, well, we'll figure that out for next time. You know, don't worry about it for this time. And this poor gal whose name had been mispronounced pronounced had no idea what to do she had no idea of how to speak up for herself and to say my name is x just say it x but she she didn't have she didn't have the language she didn't have the um the conversation to be able to to say that and she was stuck being stuck in her organization with her name being mispronounced. That's a microaggression, but understanding like when your name is wrong, guess what? Marissa, Marisa, <laughs> and Toe, you know, <laughs> it's not okay. Mm -hmm. Not okay. And especially if your name is something that has to do with your heritage, if your name has something to do with your ethnicity, if your name has something to do with you. It's as simple as that. It's something to do with you. It's not all right to have this mispronounced. It's not all right to have it misexplained. Um, anyway, so I've been I've been doing <laughs> along here like a lot. So but, no, this has been fabulous. Uh, thank you so much for sharing all of those personal experiences and stories because, like you said, this is a space where we want people to be able to. Hear hear those stories and understand what African Americans face and have faced for decades in our country that they may have never considered or may have never realized or may have never spoken to someone face to face about. Um, and one of the things I, I want to uh, touch upon from there is you, you mentioned that coming into these types of spaces to have these conversations is a great place to start. One of the questions we've gotten often from um, people on in these discussions is, how can I have these types of conversations in my work environment or in a one-on-one -on -one relationship where I don't necessarily have the guarantee that it is a safe space to have this conversation, but I know I need to have it. Um, and I'd love to hear your recommendations for that. Right, interesting. I think that number one is, well, it's, it's, it's a two-part thing. Um, one, what I'd like to encourage people to do is when they feel like, I will say when they feel like they, they are in a relatively safe space, it's really important to have the conversation as a white person to other white people. Uh, you're at a cocktail party, you're whatever's going on and you can say, you know what, Black Lives Matter, blah, blah, blah. You know what, what do you think about that? one-on-one -on -one from a white person to a white person and say this is what i think 
I feel strongly about this. Tell me what you think. And that's between two people who feel really close to each other or, or relatively close to each other, because it's that way the person who initiates the conversation can start to feel comfortable with speaking to a, a larger audience, friend to friend, just how do we have this? And it doesn't have to be, you don't have to commandeer the room, you don't have to um, be, be the big boss of the conversation, but just friend to friend, just, you know what, this is troubling me, or this is important to me, or, and this is what I w I'd like you to consider, what do you think? And, and it needs to be white person to white person, because black people have been talking about this for absolutely ever. I mean, we know, we, we, we talk, we've spoken, we've shared, we, we get it. Um, but it's gotta be white person to white person. So the first white person who says to the next one, what do you think about this? This is what I think about it and start that way. And that's, I would suggest that that starts in a personal environment, like again, at a friend's house in a smaller environment. I. More, much more challenging to talk about that in a work environment um, because work brings a whole wealth, wealth, dearth of, <laughs> of, issues, of issues with it. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely, definitely start in, in the personal space. And then once you feel more comfortable, once a white person feels more comfortable having had those conversations in the personal space, than to bring it up in the in the workspace, but again, I would recommend one on one, um, so that someone with whom you feel safe, someone who you think will get it, and and that's not always it's it's not always easy to know that, like who you think might get it or who might not get it. Um, so you're always you're always running. We are all running risks all the time. Because what we can do is we can try to bring things up and people can react negatively to us. For example, like my diversity and inclusion work, I, I try to be as open as I possibly can. And a lot of times I get people who just completely shut down. They do not want to have this conversation. They do not want to know about diversity. They do not want to know about inclusion. They don't want <laughs> and, um, and it can, it can shock me. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I can take it, uh, and I try not to take it personally, but it just shocks me. I just think, well, but this is important. Well, we're we're not going to talk about this. This is not what we're going to do. So, and that's always in the workspace. I find that in the personal space, people are more than willing to. Well, I'm discerning about who I to whom I speak, um, but in the personal space, they are much more willing to to have the conversation and to, to be open to it. But that's what I would recommend. I would start in terms of just practicing. Go with the people that you know. Go one-on-one, -on -one, private space. How does this work? You'll see, are you able to pitch the case? Are you able to see do people understand and, uh, and go from there? And, and then if you can translate into that into your workspace, then that's great. But challenging. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We're getting a few questions in already, which is great. So I just want to uh, remind everyone that we have a chat feature where you can ask questions for Karen um, that we will ask at the end of this session. Um, I want to go back, Karen, to something that you mentioned in, in your last answer about um, the fact that African Americans have been having these conversations forever. Um, and one thing we've really been talking about this month when we're talking about interpersonal racism is that um, many African Americans ha have told us or have, have expressed in these sessions that they are exhausted of having to try to teach white people about racism and exhausted about the fact that now they are getting bombarded with these questions and, and messages when this has been happening for so long. Um, and so I'd love to get your perspective on that and, and what advice you have, because we do have a diverse group on this call. Um, so what advice you have for African-Americans who might be feeling this way? Yeah, well, I completely relate. 
I mean, it, it is definitely, um, we've talked about this forever. Um, but what, what's available to us now is Black Lives Matter. And with the, the social awareness that's going on right now. So it, that, that is the opening of a door for these conversations that has not happened before. And as exhausting as it might be in terms of, and, and this is, it's a big ask, I'm telling you, but you gotta do it. I mean, we, it, uh, I, it, it is up to us, I think, to keep the conversation going and to say, all right, you know what? Um, here's what you might not get. Here's what I've said a thousand times, but because we've got this opportunity with an awareness, a, a social unrest, and uh, a real opportunity to uh, tell other people about what what we've experienced, because right now it's not the time. I'll, I'm not. It's not the time for us to be tired. But I'm going to back up for one second. I was on a um, a call with a bunch of women a couple of weeks ago. And it was called uh, Black Girls, Black Girl Magic. And we'd gotten together to do some meditating and being quiet together and rejuvenating ourselves. And to a woman, and there must have been 25 of us, everyone said, I'm exhausted. Uh, and this is, you know, a month ago, two months ago. I am exhausted. I am so tired of trying to carry this burden. But what we did was we got together. We tried to rejuvenate ourselves. We thought we don't get to, not in terms of the experience that we've had in our lives and what our ancestors have been through. We don't get to say, we're, we, we don't do this now. We don't get to say, we're too tired. We're tired, but we rejuvenate. We are tired, but we gather together. We're tired, but we support each other and say, okay, we're going to keep going forward. So in, in um, it, it's not a luxury that we have. And as a matter of fact, right now is the time to say, all right, let's, pu let's pull it together. I, I don't know how else to say it. Um, uh, and, and I understand we're, we're tired of trying to explain to white people, but we've got to keep, we've got to keep doing it. But it's also an unusual time in terms of being able to try to explain to white people what's going on. And we've got an unusual opportunity, a door being opened to allow us to get in there and say, okay, let's have this conversation. So We've got to take advantage of it. And if that means we have to redouble and rejuvenate and be together and share our, our situations and share our experiences, but let's let's empower ourselves and go forward and make make it happen because thank goodness for organizations like this where we where we have a chance, which before we didn't, which is why I'm so excited about common bonds. I mean it's just like I Again, not having heard of anything like this before, just take advantage of it. Let's do it. I don't get it at this point to say, you know, now I'm too tired. No, now I need to draw on my sisters and let them help me so that we can have these conversations. So, fabulous. Thank you. Um, I I wanted to uh, ask you about your diversity and inclusion training that you do. And um, we actually just had a, a question come in from our audience. So I'm just going to ask his question because it, it mirrors mine exactly. So Matt, thank you for the question. He asks, um, Karen, in your diversity and inclusion consulting, what are the first points you coach corporate teams on? And what are the biggest racial issues and challenges you witness in corporate America? First. What I do is I, I start at the beginning because it stuns me how few people really know what we're, what we're even talking about when we say what diversity is. And when I talk about diversity, I talk about not the monolithic black and white. I talk about 
diversity is everything. And if we can all agree that diversity is age, race, gender, military uh, involvement, um, just, uh, it, we can we can make the list almost non-ending. Then people can feel like they belong to everything. I mean, it's not a matter of saying like when I say diversity, oh diversity, that's not me. I'm not involved. No, everyone can be a part of the diverse conversation. Um, so that's the first thing I always start with. Uh, and the second piece of the conversation, I'm sorry, the second piece of the question was. Oh, what I what I find in in the biggest racial issues or challenges you witness in corporate America. Oh, it still is. How are we dealing with black people? And um, how do we talk to black people? How do we involve black people? Um, it it's really a major challenge. Uh, and it's unfortunate, but it's um, what what happens. It, it, so I come into an organization, and what I always do is come in at the upper echelon, which is really important because until elite a leadership is willing to be supportive of an, an initiative, the uh, effort's not going to take take root, it's not going to happen. So I start up there. And they are normally the first group to not necessarily think about the fact that they need to be diverse. They think everyone else needs to be diverse, but not us. But and so <laughs> they're like, no, no, you guys, uh, <laughs> You, you need to, like from top down, you need to be really, you need to have this um, awareness and this sensitivity. So that that's really the first problem that I encounter. Uh, and then they, they don't necessarily, you know, it, it's interesting. I, I get people from the firms that come to me and they say, um, we've got a problem, we're not exactly sure what it is can you figure it out for us? What what we know is post George Floyd, we don't like it, but we don't know what it is. And so I've got to come in from the very beginning and say, all right, let's have a conversation. Um, let's talk about what your numbers are. Let's talk about what your uh, um, pathways for success are. Let's talk about Let's talk about everything. And they don't necessarily want to do that. They they just want to say, okay, give us like this the silver bullet, give us the magic pill mm -hmm. and let's let you figure it out. Right. And and I and I say there's no such thing. You've got to have a willingness and an ability to commit to this to the conversation, uh, and to to make it happen. Mm -hmm. so. Absolutely. Um, before we get into the rest of the questions, um, Karen, I do want to give you an opportunity to um, share any personal messages or uh, a final thought in in terms of you know your experience and interpersonal racism and what we want um, our audience to take away today. Hmm. Sorry, that's my dog. <laughs> um. Let me see. Uh, you know, I I'm just really grateful to have the chance to say to people, let's have the conversation. Let's be able to talk and and talk clearly in black and white because that's what's going to make the difference, and that's what I'm so happy about. Uh, common bonds is uh, about and that's what I want to take away that's what I'm going to take away from this evening is to share with people and say here's what I did here's the experience here's what I want to talk to you about 
And can you get behind this? Can you understand this? Can we talk about this? Can you um, share this with me? Because it's just, it's, un, it's unusual. I can't say it's unique, but it's unusual. And it's important. And especially right now when there's this window of opportunity for, uh, for Black Lives Matter, for a, a new administration, for all these different things that can arguably go on right now, let's let's take advantage of that with organizations like or specifically common bonds and let's make a difference. So that's what I'd like to say. Thanks. And agree more. Thank you so much, Karen. We really appreciate it once again. Um, and now let's get into the questions because we have quite a few of them. Um, so I want to start with April's question here. Um, and, and she asks, you know, microaggressions to me are like a thousand tiny cuts. And as an African-American, it's so frustrating. And I think a lot of times either we mask our true feelings at work or walk around with this defeatist aura and we nonetheless carry that stress throughout our lives. Micro and macroaggressions weigh heavily on physical health. Do you agree? Oh, totally. And that's exactly what they do. That's why they are so damaging. It's because they weigh on us in ways that we don't even necessarily know. Uh, it, it's sort of going back to my ex experience in my small prep school. I know that things happened to me and I was not necessarily physically or mentally aware of them. But years later, they're like, yeah, that was, that was awful. <laughs> that, really, that really had a, a gravitas to it. And that's really important. And, and they happen in, in small ways and in large ways. I mean, and, and it's, and they're so hard because they're not necessarily something that we take a look at it and say, all right, here's this giant smash in the head with some racist comment. And we have to turn around and say, okay, that's unacceptable. I'm going to fight this. I'm going to have this battle with this, which by itself has a ton of emotional and psychic weight to it. But the many ones, the many ones are so important. Um, just really quickly, I was uh, talking to a, a, my, my boss the other day, and I said, I'm going to be giving this presentation about microaggressions. And he said, what is that? Right, just growled at me. And I went like, well, it's a matter of blah, blah, I'm trying to explain it. And I felt so minimized just trying to explain. And here I am talking about it in a, in a format which is large and important. And nonetheless, I still felt minimized by having this conversation with this guy about being, about microaggressions. And so it's, they're incredibly powerful. They're incredibly bad. <laughs> they're, they, and, they, and they just happen and happen and happen. It's, it's really unfortunate. Uh, and we've got to figure out how do we then hear it, recognize it, pick ourselves up from it, and say, not again. Mm -hmm. and, and hopefully in having this conversation that helps everyone recognize one when they see it or one when they maybe inadvertently do it because uh, as we know that there's sometimes where it can e almost be unconscious um or you know implicit bias is a big topic we talked right. about last week uh last month so um that's that's yeah. one thing i think we can all take away from this conversation is just being able to recognize when that's happening yeah exactly yeah sure yeah um, we have a great question here from Nadine. Uh, she she says, racism is a white person problem and white people need to do the work to stop systemic racism. What can you recommend for talking with white family and friends who don't even believe racism exists? Which is something I think we've seen quite a bit, you know, in the past few months nationally. That is a great question. And it's interesting how she phrased it. Um, with white families and friends, right? Because that strikes me as being very different from what happens when we deal with races who we don't know, <laughs> who I find frightening. Mm -hmm. 
right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. uh, so it, it, it kind of comes back to what I was thinking about earlier is um, when I try to encourage white people to talk to white people. But Nadine's point is, what do we do when we have these other white families that we, um, that we need to have these conversations with? I think what you can do is, I think you can say something as simple as, you know what, I was at this program the other night and we were talking about microaggressions or we were talking about racism or we were talking about her and bring it up that way so that it's not Nadine or her family trying to accuse because this is kind of what I think I'm hearing is the concern is that let's not accuse people of being racist. Mm -hmm. Let's try to have the conversation. So to say, you know, I was at this really great program, not that it was really great, but you know, <laughs> you know what I mean. Um, but I was this this great program um, from Common Bonds, and we were talking about racism and microaggressions and Black Lives Matters and all of that. So what do you what do you think? And and pose it as a question rather than any kind of uh, um, uh, sort of a um, in, insisting that someone is saying something or uh, um, so just posing it as a question. Mm -hmm. what, do you th what do you think about this? And but I think what's important meeting is like you're saying, bringing it up with white families and white people that you know, and to phrase it in a way that I could say, I was at this meeting, I heard this, this conversation, what do you think about that? And mm -hmm. start it with that so they don't feel, it, so much of this is how do people feel about how they're being approached and not being accused because who likes to be accused of anything? Who likes to be challenged on anything? I mean, I'd, I'd rather not be. Um, I, I, I'm happy to be questioned or, you know, what do you think about this? But definitely not, you know, you, you are X, Y, and Z. So it's a matter of just saying to this white family, I went to this program, it sounded very interesting. What do you think about what I heard? And maybe that's the way to get started with that. Absolutely. Um, we have a, a, a really interesting question here from, from Pamela, which I think it is following up on a, the conversation we had earlier about where to have these conversations. Um, and, and Pamela asks, perhaps it's just an echo chamber if we are speaking to people in our personal circle about this. The occurrences of racism, micro and macro aggressions in the workplace might be the most important place to have the conversation if we are to consider the amount of power, economic influence over others, especially minorities. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. Um, so not to be in this echo chamber. Um, but my, my thought, number one, is make sure that when you, when you start these conversations that you feel comfortable with your ability to articulate what they're about. And that's what I'm saying, like, share it with a friend, what, mm -hmm. what you feel most comfortable with so that you can, you can get some language together about like, how do you present this. And then you've got to figure out, I think, and it's true, it needs to go beyond this smaller sphere of just colleagues and friends, but it's got to be a matter of you feeling, or, or one feeling comfortable with um, how do we present this to this bigger world mm -hmm. uh, but i think it's mad it starts with all right here's how i can present to friends here's how i present to the outer ring of people and then here's how i present to work folks so that it, it, it expands out that way but i, I think you're absolutely right uh, it, it's gotta it, it, it's gotta go beyond just um the immediate circle of folks mm -hmm. 
Um, we have a question here from Robert. He asks, um, or says he would welcome thoughts at how to express that as tragic as black men and boys, women and girls being killed at the hands of police is, that those deaths are only the very tip of the racism that black people encounter on an ongoing basis by police, the legal system, at work, and life in general. Um, I hear people focus on the number as being relatively small and worthy of concern, um, but how can we better express that there is, it goes so much deeper than that? Yeah. Well, it's supposed to say not worthy of concern. Oh, I'm right? sorry. And no, I, 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 I wrote it. I forgot that. That's why. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Wow, that's really gone. That's a great question. Um, you know, um, Marissa, run it by me one more time. <laughs> yeah, the, the question is, um, you know, we they w would welcome any thoughts at how to express that as tragic as um, black men, boys, women and girls being killed at the hands of police is that those deaths are really only the very tip of the the iceberg when it comes to racism that black people are facing in our country, whether it be by police, the legal system at work, just systemically. You know, it's, that's it's a great point, um, and I think I think the the key word there is systemically, mm -hmm. because uh, there have been so many problems with the legal system. There are so many problems with the police. There are so many problems with lack of parity in terms of jobs, educational system, um, just. Uh, all the way across the country, it's it's just uh, it's what 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 do we do with that? And I can what can I say? Um, what I think is well, what I what I really do believe, I do believe that there has to be a change in the um, political system because uh, what's going on with the country um, is going to be, the, the remedy for that is going to start with a change in uh, the political system and systems and laws and uh, financial support and educational systems. And I mean, it, it, it literally, uh, the question is, is so profound and it's so deep, but it also runs through all the things that I'm sort of thinking of in terms of uh, what what else has to be done. And it, it's, not a, it's not a silver bullet, it's a matter of, um, of it, it's going to have to impact federal, state, local, uh, at, at literally every level of what's going on in the United States is going to have to be addressed in terms of answering that question. And uh, mm -hmm. it, uh, in, in my particular opinion, I think it starts top down. Um, and I'm optimistic that that top down will happen relatively soon. But it's got to be uh, federal, state, and local, and in every, we, we, need, we need jobs, we need education, we need uh, prison reform, we need like all, all these things. I mean, they, they all have to be addressed. Uh, but without it, there's, I, I, I cannot see success. Um, I just think it has to happen on all these different levels, so. Thank you, Karen, for that. That 
that's a great answer. And, and, you know, you said in the beginning here that you wanted, you hope that everyone was able to take away at least one thing from this discussion. And I have made notes and I'm taking away several things from, from this. So I, I thank you so much for, for joining us tonight. I have one last question for you. Um, I know we're at 6.02 um, or 7.02, excuse me, I'm on central time. <laughs> um, we're at 7.02 for you guys on the East Coast. Um, so if you do need to go, that's fine, but we always like to get to as many of the questions as we can here. Uh, we have one more for you. So um, we hope you all stick around. Uh, Karen, last question. This is from Fennell. Um, and she asks, in this moment, and, and this is similar to a question that we received earlier too, but I, I think there's a, a little more we can build on, on in this. She says, in this moment, many of my white friends have recently discovered that they have friends and family members who harbor thoughts they never thought possible, like not believing racism exists, Black Lives Matter, or that white privilege is real. Um, so how do you help them, or does the workplace have a responsibility to educate better to, to get at more people? Oh gosh, interesting. I, I Workplace is important, but I think it starts with the uh, social uh, family uh, front place, uh, mm -hmm. frontier. I really think that's where it starts. Uh, I I would hate I would hate to <laughs> this sounds terrible. I'd hate to leave anything to the workplace uh, for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, but I, I like the idea that uh, it's been all that um, it's a matter of uh, families and social and again leaning of your shoulder and sort of saying to somebody, you know, here's what we need to talk about. Let's talk about it uh, to get it kicked off. Um, yeah, but I, I understand that, but I'm, I'm not necessarily, I'm, I'm not persuaded that, that the workplace is, is the place to get it. It's a place to get that wrapped up, but not the place to get it started, I don't think. So. And I, I'm sorry I lied. We have one more question. <laughs> this really is the last one. Um, so, so Robert had asked another question. I, mean, I apologize, I missed this before, Robert. Um, but he he asks, do you find that white people are now seeking you out for conversations around these topics? Yes, they do, and I am so grateful. Uh, and I I take them up on it like like a house of fire. I mean, I, <laughs> as soon as they start, I go crackers on them, and they, <laughs> and they, they're just like, oh, I'm, I'm almost sorry I brought this up. I'm like, no, don't be sorry you brought it up. It's really important, and I want to talk about this. I want to keep this going. I want to, and what's fabulous about it is once they start it, Marissa, it's like they, they just keep going, and and they keep going, and I'll say. So talk to your friends about this. And they literally talk to their friends about it. And their friends talk to their friends about it. And it, so it just keeps going. So I, I love the fact that they talk to me and it's out of the blue. And it just keeps, it just, it just fluoresces. It's great. I, I'm so, I'm so grateful for it. It's really wonderful. Yeah. Well, we're, we are grateful to um, have had the opportunity to, to talk with you tonight, Karen. Thank you once well, again. You. Um, and I will toss it back over to Mike, my dad, for some closing thoughts. <laughs> Thank you, Marissa. And uh, Marissa, appreciate you facilitating this. I would say you're a chip off the old block, but you're a heck of a lot better at it than I am. So uh, I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, Karen, I really, really appreciate you, uh, um, you coming on and sharing your perspective on this. It's been wonderful, as you mentioned. We've gotten to know each over the last month. Um, and, and your last comment, I think April can kind of chuckle about the way that I ask her questions repeatedly. I see John Ridgway is on a very good friend of mine who uh, has helped us a great deal behind the scenes with a lot of things. And I, I, I bury him in questions consistently. Um, and, and I really do. I think the one thing in the great question Marissa asked, and you, you hear this from me, on each of these is, is, is to thank all of you for being open and sharing. Uh, and one of the things I didn't realize, which I realized is how difficult that is to do. Um, and, and, and again, what co what's different about common bonds is, is sharing the personal stories and understanding that it doesn't matter your economic status. It doesn't matter your social status. 
there's discrimination and racism that are going on against African Americans, regardless of that. Um, and you know, the wonderful thing about tonight's session as well is I love the chat dialogue that not only was the questions, but the perspectives and, and people bringing up perspectives and other people answering those perspectives. And that again is such a wonderful learning experience for all of us. So thank you for sharing. And for the folks who are on or are white, thank you for, thank you for joining. And you know, you'll hear me say consistently, listen, learn, and lead. Um, and I think what you're, what you're going to see that's very interesting um, that comes out is, is our topic for December is white privilege. And so we're really going to attack a couple of aspects of white privilege. One is going to be defining privilege. Um, and we're going to have a couple, we're going to have panel discussions. So a couple of, of folks for our two sessions. And our first session really is going to be two, two young men who, one, one being white, one being African American, who grew up in, with, with wealth, you know, grew up well off um, and, and are both uh, activists from a social perspective. And they'll tell a little bit about their reasons why. Um, and we really want to separate out the definition of privilege from a wealth perspective versus a race perspective. You know, the biggest issue that whites have, and, you know, when I bring this up to my white friends and I say, um, you know, we have white privilege, the A number one answer is I didn't grow up with money. And what we've got to do is we've got to get past the wealth aspect of it. And it is a definition of privilege, but we got to get past that and pass to the definition we're talking about on the privilege you've had of being white, the color of your skin. Um, the second conversation we're going to have is interesting, and it's going to be with two very senior leaders in corporate America who are both white, who uh, have learned through the course of the last year to that uh, what white privilege is about. Uh, and I think they're two leaders who are are going to talk about their being them, come, them being brought up in privilege, not really knowing they were brought up in privilege from a race perspective, because when you're white, you don't know that because you're not impacted. Uh, but they're going to talk about how they, uh, through the activities that occurred, how they talked to some of their African American friends, similar to what I did, and reached out to try to get that perspective. And it woke them. And they're going to talk somewhat about, um, they're, they're going to talk a lot about what they're doing about it, what they're doing about it in their personal lives and what they're doing about it in their work lives, because they have the power to do a lot of different things at the level of positions that they're at, uh, both in their personal lives and in their professional lives. So, um, you know, a lot, a lot of what Karen talked about is what Common Bonds is all about. It, it's personalizing this. Once you personalize something, you get a much bit better perspective of it. It's partnership. Um, and, and, you know, where I've learned a great deal, I'll, I'll tell you one quick story. I'll let you go. I was talking to a very good friend of mine who's white today, um, who I would say was not a, uh, was, was, really didn't know a lot about this. And he said, I've gotten, and he's been a very big supporter of Common Bonds. He said, I've been educated by my kids. You know, my kids have sat me down and said, you got to learn this. And I will tell you the same thing with me. Um, and so when you talk with family and friends, you know, be the one who educates the others um, or have, have your children or your, or your, or your brothers or sisters because I'm doing a lot of that education as well. And that's really, as Karen said, is a great place to start. And we have a partnership program that, that looks to do a lot of that as well. So Karen, wonderful. I really appreciate it. Again, we've been blessed. I know Sam is on listening today and was our guest on Tuesday. We've been blessed with people who are willing to share their personal stories. And, and that's what we want and really, really appreciate you taking the time to do that. Um, so, you know, I, I, so, Keep an eye out on social media. Uh, we got a number of things that um, uh, we're going to be doing next week that are um, that'll be of interest. I think the one big one, what I'll share with you is, as you all of you know, we 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 lost one of our young board members uh, a couple of weeks ago, tragically. Um, so we're going to be honoring her uh, with something next week as a mem memorializing her to continue her spirit and her passion around this topic. So you'll see some of that. Uh, and then the week after Thanksgiving, 
is when we're going to start our, our topic on white privilege with a lot of great information to share and I'm sure a lot of great dialogue uh, and interest. So hope you enjoyed it. Please encourage, uh, encourage you to join us again. Encourage your friends to join us as well. Encourage feedback on the approach that we're taking. And, uh, and thanks for spending the time. Have a wonderful and safe Thanksgiving. And I look forward to seeing all of you again really soon. Take care, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.